Hello, Professor. You can start. Okay, thank you. Uh, let us start. Uh, so uh, we continue our study of simple spherical varieties. Uh, uh, let me recall the notation from the previous lecture. So by X now I denote a simple spherical variety. That means uh, a spherical variety containing a, a, a single closed orbit denoted by Y. Uh, and uh, for uh, uh, this spherical variety, uh, for this closed orbit, I denoted by uh, V upper Y, uh, the set of G invariant valuations corresponding to G stable divisors in X, these divisors will automatically contain the closed G orbit. Uh, and also by D over Y, uh, I denoted uh, the set of all colors of all B stable, but not G stable prime divisors on X, uh, which contain the closed orbit Y, the closed G orbit Y. So these two finite sets. Uh, and also um, uh, here is the notation for the open subset in X, X sub Y over, uh, over naught. Uh, uh, this is an open subset uh, uh, obtained by removing all colors uh, which do not contain the closed orbit, okay? And this open subset uh, was called a B-chart, uh, open B-chart of the orbit Y. And um, we are in the course of proving uh, of the following lemma, lemma one, which says that actually this B-chart is uh, the smallest B-stable affine open subset intersecting the closed orbit Y. Uh, and the coordinate algebra of this uh, open B chart can be described uh, as the set of all functions uh, uh, which have B stable poles. That means uh, that they are regular on the open B orbit. So recall that this notation uh, Y upper node uh, is uh, uh, the notation for the open B orbit sitting in the open G orbit. Uh, so uh, these uh, functions has, have to be regular on the open B orbit, so they may have poles only outside it. Uh, so the poles are B stable. And also they cannot have poles on divisors intersecting this uh, B chart. This means that uh, for the divisors corresponding to these two finite sets, V over Y and D over Y, y the, uh, valuation, the, value, the valuations corresponding to these divisors uh, should take non-negative non values on F. So uh, uh, F cannot have a pole uh, at, at such a color D containing Y. And uh, F cannot have a pole uh, on, uh, along uh, a G-stable divisor containing Y. So this value should also be uh, non-negative, okay? So uh, we are in the course of proving this lemma. And what we already proved um, uh, at the previous lecture is the following. Uh, we proved that there exists a B-stable affine open subset, uh, X0, uh, intersecting the closed orbit Y. Uh, this we did by, by uh, taking... Uh, uh, by embedding uh, X in the uh, in a projective space and uh, so taking some hyperplane section or hypersurface section, better to say, uh, in this projective space. Uh, this was at the end of the previous lecture. Uh, so uh, this open affine subset X naught, uh, uh, the comp the uh, complement of this uh, open affine subset is a union of finitely many prime divisors, D1, D1, Ds. All these prime divisors are, of course, uh, B-stable, but not G-stable, because all G-stable divisors uh, are contain, uh, contain Y and intersect this open subset. So uh, these uh, divisors D1, Ds are colors in the complement of the set uh, D over Y. So this set D over Y, uh, let me uh, recall you that this set contains uh, consists of all colors containing Y. And now uh, we are looking for colors uh, which uh, do not contain Y because they do not intersect this, uh, this uh, X naught. Yeah? So uh, these colors are in the complement. So this is a subset 
a, a maybe a proper subset, um, uh, the, uh, the set of these colors is maybe a proper subset of colors uh, not containing Y. So this S is, is smaller or equal than T. Uh, here is the picture. Again, uh, I, I have taken the picture from the previous lecture. Uh, you have already seen it uh, at the previous lecture and the end of the previous lecture. Uh, so uh, uh, this is the picture uh, of X, of my simple embedding X and close G orbit Y. And this uh, a fine open chart, a fine open subset X not intersecting this chart. Uh, and uh, the colors which do not contain Y are of two types. Some of them uh, do intersect X not. So this is if uh, if J is uh, greater than S. And some of them uh, are in the complement of X naught. This is for uh, I uh, less or equal than S. Uh, uh, so um, uh, uh, we want to uh, consider uh, the canonical B chart uh, denoted X, uh, X uh, Y naught. And uh, uh, for this purpose, uh, to get this canonical B chart, we have to remove all these DJs, all the colors which intersect X naught, but do not contain Y. We have to remove all these colors uh, from the picture to obtain uh, the canonical open uh, B chart. So how can we do it? Now let's uh, continue the proof. How can we do it? So we can choose we can choose uh, a regular function f on this affine open subset x naught, which uh, vanishes identically on each of these divisors dj for all j greater than s. Okay these divisors marked by yellow on the picture, but does not vanish identically on Y. So since Y is not contained, uh, is since, um, since uh, Y is not contained in the union of these divisors, uh, it is possible to find such a function which vanishes on all these divisors, but does not vanish on Y. Uh, y. Now we want y. yes. Well, well, this is just by 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 standard arguments from a fine algebraic geometry. So this is an affine variety. X naught is an affine variety, and you have a closed sub variety given by the union of these DJs. And you have another closed subvariety, uh, the intersection of uh, Y with X naught, uh, a closed subvariety in X naught, which is not contained in the first one. So uh, this closed subvariety is not contained in this closed subvariety. And therefore, there is, uh, 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 um, uh, there is no inverse inclusion for vanishing ideals. So uh, the vanishing ideal of uh, Y uh, um, does not contain uh, the vanishing ideal of uh, of this guy, of dj. And therefore, uh, uh, we can find a function which sits in one of these vanishing ideals and does not sit in another one, okay? Because closed sub-varieties are uh, uniquely defined by their vanishing ideals, and since one sub-variety yes, is yes, not I contained, know, know you see this. Okay, okay, this is because everything is defined now. So for affine varieties, you always can choose such a find such a function. Okay, but uh, what we want to do, we want to replace f by a b semi invariant function. For this, we need a blow up construction from algebraic geometry. So let me uh, say a few words about blow up. So some time ago, uh, some one of you asked me whether I am going to use blow ups uh, in my uh, lecture course. I told that uh, I am not going to use it systematically and in details, but at some point I need this uh, this notion blow up. So what I want to do, 
uh, well, maybe first uh, let me give you a reference because I don't actually want uh, to explain uh, this construction in detail. It is not my purpose. So uh, a detailed reference uh, for the general blow up is, for instance, the book of Hart's form, algebraic geometry, the classical book of Hart's form. Uh, the blow up is discussed in chapter two and uh, section seven of this chapter. Uh, but of course, uh, you can uh, find uh, find uh, the discussion of blow ups in any reasonable textbook uh, on algebraic geometry. So this is not a unique source. It's just for 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 instance. Uh, in fact, uh, we do not need the explicit construction of blow up. Uh, the only thing we need is the geometric property of the blow up. So uh, uh, what, uh, what we uh, want to do, we want to blow up the closed orbit Y. We want to blow up uh, this uh, closed orbit Y in X. And the only thing we need from this construction is the following geometric property. So uh, there is uh, yet another uh, uh, spherical G variety. Uh, let me put it again in, in black. Uh, there is yet another uh, spherical G variety X prime uh, together with a morphism with a map from x to x prime such that from x uh, prime so, not from ex x. excuse me excuse me what well, is your you question write, you write the you write the morphism from x prime to x exactly the morphism from x prime to x so x is so x contains the closed uh, uh, g orbit y, which I want to blow up, and this uh, blown up variety x prime contains a prime divisor d. Uh, well, maybe d naught. It is a distinguished divisor d naught, uh, a g stable prime divisor, g stable prime divisor, which, which is called the exceptional divisor, which is mapped onto y. And the complement of this divisor, x prime minus d naught, is mapped isomorphically onto the complement, onto the complement of this orbit y. So, uh, in brief, what does it mean? Uh, this means that outside Y, outside Y, and outside this divisor uh, D naught, X and X prime are the same. So, uh, some modification occurs at this orbit. This orbit uh, is transformed to a divisor. Okay? So, this uh, closed orbit uh, Y is blown up to this divisor. So, for instance, its dimension may increase, but outside this orbit, nothing changes. So, uh, this is a property of the blow up, and this is the only property we need, actually, because uh, uh, the explicit construction, well, it takes some time to explain what is it. If you don't know it, uh, uh, then it is better to look, uh, for instance, here or in, uh, in, in another reference book. But we only need this property. Um, in fact, we have uh, the x prime is spherical. I think we can only deduce that x prime is a G variety. Uh, well, since well, since x prime is birationally isomorphic to x, it is automatically spherical because it, it has uh, the same open orbit. It is birationally isomorphic to x because outside of this closed subset, it is just isomorphic to x. Okay. So it is uh, automatically spherical, uh, spherical G variety. Uh, and uh, well, uh, maybe um, I should be more precise here because um, actually um, when you blow up this uh, orbit Y or more generally, you may blow up any closed sub variety and even a closed sub scheme uh, in the language of schemes. If you know this language, uh, you can do even like this. Uh, but um, uh, when you blow up 
uh, when you blow up a closed sub variety, then uh, you may obtain a divisor with several prime components. Uh, but uh, uh, you may remove all these components uh, from the picture except but one. Uh, so if uh, if the pre-image, if the inverse image of the blown up uh, variety Y contains several uh, prime divisors, then you may just uh, uh, you you may just uh, kick off uh, all components of these prime divisors except a single one. Then of course uh, this morphism will be no longer proper. Uh, the blow up morphism, uh, uh, maybe better to say blow down morphism from here to here is always proper. But if you remove something from X prime, then uh, you know, this morphism will no longer be proper. But still I will call it a blow up because uh, the only thing I need is this picture. So for me, blow up is this kind of picture, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, now let us uh, denote uh, the Professor, valuation. Yes, any question? You say that which can have multiple components? Uh, uh, you mean uh, the multiplicity? Uh, so so, so uh, could you please repeat your question? Maybe I didn't get it clearly. No, you could you can choose a single one and I'm not very clear. Is the why can have many parts or? Well, I mean, if if uh, if the variety y uh, is not in the uh, if, if the if the sub variety y is in the singular locus of X, then some nasty things may happen, uh, and even the variety y itself may be uh, may be uh, may be uh, singular. And when you blow up a singular thing, then something something may happen because uh, well, uh, if if you analyze in details uh, the construction, the blow up construction at, at a singular sub variety, then um, you will see that some unexpected things may may happen. But uh, for me, uh, uh, for me, uh, all these complications are inessential because even if I had uh, several components, then I just remove all of them but one. I need a single component for my for my uh, considerations. Okay. So um, let me uh, let me uh, continue then. Or maybe I should move it a little bit upper here, for instance. Okay. So uh, let me uh, denote by V naught. Let me denote by V naught. Uh, uh, the uh, G invariant valuation of the function field corresponding to this exceptional divisor D naught. This is a G invariant valuation. And clearly, uh, we see uh, uh, from uh, uh, from the previous discussion. So uh, we introduced this function f uh, uh, before, uh, 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 such that it does not vanish identically. Uh, it is regular on this uh, affine subset x not intersecting y. So uh, this function f is regular no, on x not. Yes, yes. We, we we identify the invariant valuation on x prime and x, right? Yes, so of we, course, because they are birational isomorphic. They say so, they so have we, one and so the same. Can, so we can say that the valuation associated to D naught belongs to the valuation on x, right? Exactly, exactly. This is uh, oh, this was already discussed uh, on previous lectures. Uh, I told you that uh, the valuation, the set of G invariant valuations, is a birational invariant. So we may canonically identify these two subsets for two birationally isomorphic spherical varieties, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, let me come back to this F. F is regular on X naught. So it is uh, defined, so its domain of definition uh, intersects, uh, intersects this Y. And F does not vanish identically on Y. This means that the pullback of F uh, to X prime uh, does not vanish identically on D naught. So uh, the domain of this pullback intersects uh, D naught and uh, 
uh, this pullback function uh, does not vanish identically on D0. This means that uh, the value of uh, this valuation V0 at F is, non -zero, is zero. It has neither zeros nor poles along D0. So this value is zero. Okay? Uh, this is what we have uh, about this uh, function uh, f. And now we may use uh, the second approximation lemma. So let me turn to the next page. Uh, we can use the second approximation lemma. Uh, from the previous, I guess, from the, not previous, from the, uh, from lecture 12, I guess second approximation lemma. Uh, which says, uh, roughly speaking, that uh, if you have a function uh, uh, with uh, B-stable poles, if you have a function with B-stable poles, uh, like this F, uh, and if you have a G invariant valuation, then you may replace this function by a B semi-invariant function, which of course still have uh, has B stable poles. And the value of this chosen valuation at this B semi-invariant function will be the same as the value on F. And all other uh, G invariant valuations will have uh, values uh, greater or equal than uh, they had on this uh, previous function F. And the same holds for colors. So replacing uh, replacing uh, f with this uh, with this uh, semi-invariant function f lambda. So the the second approximation lemma says that there exists a semi-invariant uh, function f lambda. Of eigenweight lambda, size that size that uh, uh, such that uh, first uh, the value of v naught at this function f lambda is the same as the value of f that is it is equal to zero and the value uh, of all other uh, of all these the values of all these colors dj on which the function f vanishes, yeah? Uh, the values of all these colors, uh, of um, the valuations corresponding to all these colors dj on f lambda are greater, er, uh, are greater or equal than uh, the values uh, at f. So the vanishing orders of uh, f along dj. But this vanishing order is positive because f has a zero along dj. And uh, this means that these uh, vanishing orders are still positive for any j greater than s. OK? So uh, uh, we started from a function f with these properties. And we got a semi-invariant function, f lambda, with the same properties because of this, uh, because of this uh, equalities and inequalities. OK? Uh, now, uh, when uh, you take the uh, non-vanishing locus of this function f lambda along, uh, uh, when you take the non-vanishing locus of this function f lambda, uh, on this open subset x naught. So the vanishing locus is just the union of all these dj's because uh, this function is BCMI invariant. So uh, the, its zeros are also B, uh, uh, um, the function f lambda is uh, semi invariant now. So its zeros are B stable. <laughs> and uh, 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 all dj's, all these colors, are contained in the zeros of this function f lambda. So when you take the non-vanishing locus of f lambda, you just remove all these dj's from the picture. This means that you that you get the complement of the union of these dj's in x naught. 
And it, it, it is exactly the canonical B chart. So the canonical B chart, the canonical B chart, um, so then uh, the canonical B chart X, Y naught is nothing. So let me write first that it is just X naught minus D S plus one, etc. D key. So we are removing all remaining colors not containing Y. So finally, we removed all colors uh, not containing Y. And uh, at the same time, it is just the non-vanishing locus, the set of X in X naught, on which this function F lambda takes non-zero values. And this implies it is an affine open subset. Because when you take an affine variety uh, and uh, you take the non-vanishing locus of a single polynomial on this affine variety, then you get an affine open subset. It is what is called a principal uh, open subset, principal affine open subset. Okay? And also, since we already removed uh, since we uh, already removed uh, all uh, colors d1, ds uh, to get uh, x0 from x, we already removed the colors d1, dx. We can write that x0, uh, that, um, that x, y0 is obtained from x by removing all these colors d1, etc dt okay and this implies this implies that uh, regular functions regular functions on x y not uh, may have poles on X only along these divisors D1, DT. Uh, and the description uh, now the description uh, of the coordinate algebra of x y naught given in this formula uh, stems from this observation because what what is written here it is written here that uh, the coordinate algebra of x y naught consists of all functions which have b stable poles this is this condition and which do not have poles uh, along uh, B stable divisors um, uh, in these two sets. So G stable divisors and uh, uh, colors containing Y. So they may have only poles along colors not containing Y, along colors in this open subset. And this is exactly what is written here. So from this observation, uh, 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 the description of the coordinate algebra immediately stems. So this implies the description of the coordinate algebra of the B stable affine chart. And so uh, we proved uh, the first lemma. So we proved the, the first lemma because we uh, proved that this B chart is an affine open subset. It is obviously contained in any other open subset intersecting Y because of this, uh, because of this discussion, because any such open subset <clears throat> is obtained from X by removing some colors not containing Y. And when you remove all colors not containing Y, then you get the canonical uh, B chart. So the canonical B chart is contained in any other such X node.
and it is a fine. Thus, we have proved uh, this statement that it is this, the smallest B stable affine open subset intersecting Y. And also, we proved this description for its coordinate algebra. So, this ends the proof of uh, the first lemma. Okay? So, any questions maybe on the proof? So here you see that uh, we use the approximation lemma to replace uh, a function by a B semi invariant function. And uh, we shall do it frequently in the sequel. So uh, the second approximation lemma will work in uh, several other arguments uh, which will occur in our discussion. So are there any questions so far? Not yet, okay. Um, now let me organize the data which uh, correspond to a simple spherical variety a bit differently. So uh, coming back to this first page, uh, we have this set of valuations, finite set of, excuse me, uh, finite set of valuations corresponding to G-stable prime divisors in my simple variety, G-stable prime divisors containing the closed orbit Y. And also we have this set of colors containing uh, this closed orbit Y. Uh, to each of, uh, of, this, uh, of these finite sets, there corresponds a set of vectors in the vector space um, spanned by uh, the dual weight lattice. Uh, and let us consider the convex cone uh, uh, spent by these vectors in this uh, vector space. So let us define the cone. Uh, let me denote it by script C. So maybe it looks rather than uh, rather like E than C. So script C sub Y. It is by definition the cone, convex cone spanned by the vectors v and vd bar, where v ranges over this set of vectors v over y in the valuation cone, and d ranges over all colors in dy, over all colors containing the closed orbit. So this is a cone. Uh, a convex cone, finitely generated polyhedral convex cone in the vector space E, which let me remind you that this is the vector space spanned by the dual of the weight lattice. It is lambda star tensor with Q over Z. Uh, maybe I should draw a picture for this cone. Let me do it here. This is so this one. Sorry. Something like this. Uh, Something like this. This is the cone C Y uh, spanned by uh, vectors of this kind, of these two types. So some of the vectors are in the valuation cone. For instance, let this let this be a vector of the form V in this notation. And some of these vectors are uh, determined by colors. So maybe this vector will correspond to a color, Vd bar. Uh, and all these vectors span a convex cone denoted by C sub Y. Uh, by the way, uh, let me give you a remark uh, uh, following this first lemma. 
let me make a remark uh, about uh, which sheds some light about the geometric meaning of this cone. So uh, a B semi invariant function f lambda uh, is regular on the open uh, B chart, so belongs to the coordinate algebra of the open B chart. F lambda is a B semi invariant function, right? Yes, F lambda is my usual notation for a B semi invariant rational function on my spherical variety. And lambda is its eigenweight. So this function is regular on the open B chart. If and only if, if and only if, uh, its eigenweight lambda uh, belongs to the dual cone, to the dual cone C, Y, check. And of course, it is a lattice vector in the dual cone, so, so it belongs to the uh, uh, lattice points uh, in the dual cone. Uh, what is the dual cone? Well, this is a standard notion from the convex geometry, the dual cone. Maybe let me recall you. So dual cone. Uh, it is given by inequalities. coming from the vectors in the initial cone. So the inequalities are of the form, a pairing of V with lambda is non-negative for any V in the initial cone. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, it suffices to take V only from the generating set of this initial cone. So it suffices to take uh, V among these vectors spanning the cone C sub gamma, sub sub uh, Y. Uh, and this condition that the pairing of lambda with all these vectors, with all these vectors is non-negative, means that this function has no poles along the corresponding divisors. And this exactly means that this function belongs to uh, regular functions on the open chart because of this description of the coordinate algebra of the B chart uh, in lemma one. So uh, the lattice points in the dual cone correspond, correspond to uh, semi-invariant functions which are regular on the open B chart. Maybe let me also draw this dual cone uh, on the picture. Uh, let it be well, let it be yellow for instance i don't know if it is a good color for this but anyway so this is here i try to to draw the dual cone of course the dual cone sits in the dual space but uh, as before i uh, uh, draw it on the picture on the same picture so the dual space and the initial space are on the one and the same picture uh, so these two rays should be perpendicular to the rays uh, of the uh, initial cone. And now I'm trying to draw it in this way. Well, I guess now it, it looks somewhat alike what I want to have. So this is a dual cone. Yeah, so this is C. This is, excuse me, C, Y, check. Okay, so um, uh, let's proceed. Uh, we uh, started from, we started from uh, these two subsets. The, da the data uh, corresponding to a simple spherical variety, these two subsets, and we reorganized it in a different way. So uh, instead of the first of these subsets, uh, V uh, over Y, uh, we consider uh, the cone uh, 
Well, um, uh, we introduced, well, maybe uh, I'm a bit hasty. Uh, so uh, uh, we defined a new data, a new datum, uh, a, a cone in this vector space E, uh, uh, determined by these two finite subsets. Uh, 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 the corresponding vectors in the vector space V. Now, um, uh, uh, the next uh, two lemmas describe uh, some properties of this cone, of this cone C sub Y. Let me uh, formulate the second lemma. So lemma two. Lemma two says that the cone uh, C sub Y is pointed. And uh, furthermore, for any D in the set of colors DY, in the set of colors containing Y, uh, the corresponding vector uh, the corresponding vector uh, in the vector space uh, in the vector space E is non-zero. So V D bar is always non-zero. Let's first prove this. Uh, well, I want to ask, uh, what do you mean by pointed? Uh, well, uh, I already mentioned this notion uh, in my previous lecture. Pointed, pointed means uh, uh, not containing any line. Pointed in, means having an apex. Well, 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 well. I searched on the wiki and uh, and uh, there it says that pointed means containing the origin. Uh, well, uh, there is a difference uh, between pointed and uh, punctured, maybe. Uh, so, so what is what, what is your meaning for pointed? Can you repeat what what, what did you uh, mean by pointed? Uh, the pointed on the wiki page said that the pointed means containing the origin. Containing the origin, yeah. Well, uh, no, 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 no. I don't think this is a, a, a proper meaning because uh, um, uh, the cones, the convex cones, which I consider are always containing an origin. Uh, and pointed mean exactly they, that they do not contain any subspace, any line, any one dimensional subspace or any subspace of bigger dimension, this doesn't matter. So pointed means this. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe <laughs> I should take a look in Wikipedia and. Uh... No, 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 no. I think I did not search on the convex column page. The convex column page said that pointed mean. Uh, oh no, the pointed have many uh, many meanings. Uh, no, no. Yeah, not... of course, of course, of course. Uh, well, but... the, the 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 Wikipedia says pointed and blunt. Uh, are opposite direction. Uh, I see. Uh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah. Well, uh, well. I don't want to discuss terminology. Let us just fix uh, terminology for uh, for my lectures. For me, pointed means exactly what I said. Pointed. Uh, if you speak, if you speak about convex cones, pointed means exactly that uh, uh, it is a cone not containing a line, or not containing a subspace in the ambient vector space. And also for me, a cone is always uh, something uh, containing the origin, because uh, by a cone I mean uh, by a convex cone I mean something which is closed under addition and multiplication uh, by uh, non-negative scalars. Okay, so uh, uh, from this, by definition, it follows that uh, such a cone should contain the origin. Uh, and cone, the cone is pointed if the origin is the apex of this cone, if it is uh, an extremal point, then uh, <clears throat> then uh, uh, this cone uh, is called pointed. Okay, uh, so this is about terminology. Uh, and now, <clears throat> now let me turn to the proof of this lemma. So, how to prove it? Um, well. Again, uh, uh, the argument is more or less similar to the previous lemma. Uh, uh, we may choose 
we may choose well, a regular well, function. The, the, the two part of the theorem, the both belong to lemma two, right? Lemma two. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yes, yes, yes. Uh, you are right. Uh, so both statements uh, belong to lemma two. So the first statement is that the cone is pointed, and the second statement is that the vectors corresponding to the colors from this set uh, uh, are always non-zero. So yes, yes. Both statements will be proved now uh, by one and the same argument, by the way. That's why they are in one and the same lemma. So the argument is as follows. Uh, choose a, we may choose a function. Choose a regular function. on the open B chart, uh, which vanishes identically on all B stable uh, prime divisors in this chart. For all B stable uh, D in X, Y, not. There are finitely many of these divisors. Uh, uh, they exactly correspond to these, these uh, B-stable uh, prime divisors uh, in the open B chart. Exactly, uh, exactly uh, correspond uh, to these uh, to these uh, valuations, uh, which give you the vectors generating this code. Okay, and you can choose a function uh, which vanishes identically on all divisors from this finite set. Just take a, a function uh, from the vanishing ideal of the union of these divisors. Okay? Uh, what does it mean? This means, in particular, uh, this means, uh, excuse me, uh, this means, uh, in particular, that uh, the values of, of all Vs uh, from this set v over y are positive on such a function. And uh, the vanishing orders of uh, this function along all these colors, so the values of vds for all colors corresponding to the, uh, in this subset dy uh, are uh, also positive. So there are uh, the function f has zeros um, uh, along all these uh, along all these um, divisors, and now we again apply the second approximation lemma. From lecture twelve, I guess. Well, uh, I mean, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, well. The m should not be identically zero, right? Uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, uh, uh, by this equality, I mean that that it is identically zero on D. It vanishes on D. But we cannot choose choose x f to be zero. So how can well, we ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, we can choose we can choose uh, f to be identically zero on the whole on the whole variety. Of course, uh, this will no, this will not work. F itself is non-zero, but it vanishes identically. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> this is a trivial uh, remark, but it is important, of course, to understand this. Thank you. So uh, we choose a non-zero regular function, which vanishes identically on all these devices. And now the second approximation lemma allows us to replace this function by a semi-invariant function. So we may assume, actually, by the second approximation lemma, we may assume that f is semi-invariant. Because when we replace uh, the function, the initial function f, by a semi-invariant function coming from the approximation lemma, then these values can also, may also in, um, can only increase. So if they were positive, they will be still positive after this replacement. OK? This is exactly what the approximation lemma says. And uh, therefore, 
since this semi-invariant function f, uh, uh, since this semi-invariant function f lambda has these properties, uh, then uh, its eigenweight lambda has positive pairings with all these vectors, with all these vectors, v and v d bar. So this implies, this implies that the pairings of V and V D bar with lambda are positive for any V in this set and any D in this set. In other words, we get uh, a linear function uh, taking, uh, we get a linear function given by this eigenweight lambda taking positive values on all generators of this cone. Taking positive values on all generators of this cone. So the picture looks like this uh, again. Let me draw a picture for you. So we have this, uh, we have this cone. This is my cone uh, this is my cone C Y. Uh, here are the generators of this cone. So I, I just reproduced the picture from the previous page. So here are the generators. Maybe let me draw it better. These are these. These are V D bars, uh, and we have a, we have a, a linear function lambda given by this uh, linear function given by a vector in the in the dual space. So this lambda, uh, which takes positive values on uh, all generators of this cone, uh, it defines a hyperplane in the initial vector space. So this hyperplane, this hyperplane, such that the whole cone is on one side, uh, on one side, uh, on, in, 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 one, in one and the same, uh, in one of the half spaces corresponding to this hyperplane. So uh, this, means, <clears throat> this means in particular that uh, it is pointed. And also uh, uh, by, also by uh, these inequalities, we see that all these vectors are non-zero. They are all in this uh, in this half space, so the lemma is proven, and uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, ends the first uh, half of my today's lecture. Okay, so let let us make a ten minutes break, and I am ready to answer your questions if any. Any questions so far or comments, whatever. Okay, so uh, if there are uh, no more comments uh, or questions for the moment, then uh, let me turn off my microphone but if you, uh, if any questions come to your mind, then I will switch it on again and answer. Just ask.
Okay, <clears throat> I think it is time to continue the lecture. So we have proved uh, that this cone is pointed, uh, and uh, uh, additionally, uh, the vectors corresponding to colors in this distinguished subset uh, are non zero, all the vectors are non zero. So the next lemma uh, gives us yet another property of this cone, lemma three. says that the relative interior, the relative interior of uh, this cone C -R -C -Y, let me denote the relative interior by this, uh, um, by this superscript zero on above. So this is the notation for relative interior. What differs from relative interior by interior? Well, uh, the interior is the set of uh, interior points uh, of, of this cone in the ambient vector space. And the relative interior is the set of interior points in the linear span of this cone, which may be smaller than the ambient vector space. Okay? So, uh, in other words, <clears throat> relative interior is exactly... Oh. So, so, so this relative interior is, uh, is for the sake of the fact that uh, the CY is not solid, right? Uh, CY is not solid. It is pointed, but it is not necessarily solid, right? And therefore, so uh, you have to be careful here. You you have to consider relative interiors instead of just interiors. So, you may say that the relative interior of a cone is uh, obtained by removing all, all proper faces. This is what is the relative interior. Okay? And uh, the lemma says that uh, the relative interior of uh, this cone CY intersects the valuation cone. So uh, there is a point uh, in the relative interior on CY which corresponds to a G invariant valuation, which sits in the valuation cone. This is yet another property of this cone. Let me give you the proof. Here again, I use the blow up of the closed orbit. The proper face, proper faces mean the faces of dimension less than the cone, right? Exactly, exactly. Face of smaller dimension. So uh, uh, I use the blow up of the closed orbit in my spherical, in my simple spherical variety X. Let me remind you that this blow up construction gives you another spherical variety, X prime, together with a birational map from X prime onto X, such that uh, uh, the inverse image of Y under this uh, my birational map is a, a prime divisor, a G-stable prime divisor, D0. And in the complement of this divisor, this map is uh, an isomorphism. Uh, and uh, we have the valuation V0 corresponding to this exceptional divisor. It is, uh, it, this valuation corresponds to a vector in the valuation cone. Okay? Now, uh, if you take any uh, lambda, any weight lambda, uh, sitting uh, in the dual cone, a lattice vector in the dual cone, then by the remark which we already made uh, after the proof of lemma one, the corresponding B semi-invariant function F lambda is regular on the open B chart. Uh, now suppose uh, that uh, there exists. Suppose that uh, this lambda, suppose that this lambda was chosen in such a way that there exists at least one of the generators of the cone CY. There exists either a vector in here or there exists a color in here. 
in this set such that either the pairing of V with lambda is positive or the pairing of V D bar with lambda is positive. Okay? Suppose that at least for one of these or this uh, of, of, of this uh, uh, at least for one of these or these vectors, uh, such a strict inequality holds. Uh, then the corresponding function f lambda vanishes on the respective divisor corresponding to this valuation. So uh, f lambda equals zero for some uh, B stable prime divisor in this B chart. Uh, uh, B stable prime divisors uh, intersecting the B chart uh, are exactly uh, the divisors corresponding to these uh, valuations uh, from the above line. Okay? Uh, but since all these divisors uh, sitting, all these B stable divisors sitting in the B chart contain the closed G orbit, this implies that f lambda vanishes on y. And this implies in turn that uh, f lambda, or better to say it's pulled back to x prime, but since they are birationally uh, isomorphic, uh, x prime is birationally isomorphic with x, uh, it is more or less the same function. As a rational function, it is the same function. So since f lambda vanishes on y, it's pulled back to x prime, vanishes on d naught. And this means that the pairing of v naught with lambda is again positive. So let's look uh, at what we have got. Uh, if lambda in the dual cone is chosen in such a way that uh, it takes positive values at, uh, on at least one of the generators, so since lambda is in the dual cone, it takes non-negative values here and here. But if at least one of these values is positive, then this value also is positive. So uh, uh, the vector v naught which we exhibited has this property that it, it takes positive values on all lambdas in the dual cone on which at least one of the generator takes positive values. Now it is an easy exercise in, in convex geometry, geometry to deduce uh, that uh, this implies that uh, v naught sits in the relative interior of the cone CY. So we found a vector uh, which sits both in the relative interior of this cone and in the valuation cone. This uh, proves the lemma. Any questions? Oh, we not belong to the valuation cone of x, right? Uh, because yes, it because it comes from the from a g-stable prime divisor. Mm -hmm. Because uh, because this divisor is g-stable, and v not is the valuation corresponding to this device. Okay. More questions? Well, if not, then uh, let's formulate the next lemma, the final lemma, which allows you to restore this set V over Y from this set and from this cone. So this will be the fourth lemma. Lemma four. It says 
that the set of valuations V over Y corresponding to uh, G-stable prime divisors uh, in my simple variety X is exactly the set of all indivisible lattice vectors of all indivisible lattice vectors sitting in the dual lattice of lambda of the weight lattice. Well, maybe let me put it on the next line because I need a bit more space than I have here. Yeah. So V uh, over, uh, over Y is the set of all indivisible uh, lattice vectors uh, on extremal rays. On extremal rays of the cone CY, not containing any vector coming from colors in the set D over Y. So morally, this lemma says that if we know this cone and if we know this set, we can recover this set. Okay? Let me give you a proof. Uh, so, uh, if you have any vector in the set VI, VY, uh, it corresponds to some G-stable prime divisor on X. V equals VD, where D is a G-stable prime divisor well, on X. Professor, the extreme of rays uh, means rays on the surface or, or the edge of the core. Edges, edges. This means edges of the cone. This means uh, extremal rays, in other words, uh, extremal rays are faces of dimension one one-dimensional faces or edges. Yes, maybe let me let me write it here. Okay. Well, okay. I think it, 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 it suffices. It is sufficient to have this. Okay. So. Uh, let me continue with the proof. So uh, any vector in this set, V, or v over Y, uh, corresponds to a G-stable prime divisor on X. Okay? Uh, now we can take a function. There exists a function which is regular on the open B chart. Uh, and uh, which is uh, which does not vanish identically on this D, but which vanishes identically on all other B stable divisors uh, containing the closed orbit. On all other B stable divisors D prime for any B stable. D prime uh, in X containing the closed orbit and distinct from D. Well, again, the same argument as before in the proof of lemma one. Uh, uh, we have this D, and we have the union of all other D primes. And D is not contained in the union of all other D primes, so you can find a function which is uh, identically zero on uh, the union of these D primes and not identically zero on D.
which lies in one vanishing ideal and does not belong to the other vanishing ideal. Okay? Because what you are doing, uh, you, you, you are considering everything on this affine variety x, y naught. So you can find such a function. Uh, and this means, in the language of valuations, this means, of course... Well, Professor, how can we prove that the union of d prime does not contain d? Oh, because well, because, be, because, because all these guys are divisors. So you have finitely many d primes. Uh, the union of uh, these uh, finitely many d primes is um, a, re a maybe reducible uh, subvariety, uh, and uh, its components are d primes. And if d d itself is a, an irreducible subvariety of codimension one, if d is contained in the union of these components, then it, it it has to be contained in one of these components. Otherwise, d itself would be a reducible variety. D is irreducible, so it has to be contained in one of the components of the union of D primes by irreducibility. Okay. Okay. So in the language of valuations, uh, 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 what was written on the previous in the previous two lines means that um, uh, uh, the value of V at F is zero because uh, f has not uh, zero along d, then the valuation takes the zero value. The vanishing order is zero. But uh, the value of v prime at f is positive for any v prime in v gamma minus v. And the vanishing order along all d prime which is a color containing y. So, uh, so I don't need a bar here. The vanishing order of f along all of these d primes is also positive for any d prime in the set of colors containing y. Okay. So we have this bunch of equalities and inequalities, and again by the second approximation lemma, we may replace this function f by a semi-invariant semi function. So we may assume that f is semi-invariant. Uh, and now this bunch of uh, equalities, f inequalities, gives you the following. So the pairing of v with lambda is zero. The pairing of v prime with lambda is positive. And the pairing of v d prime bar of, with lambda is also positive for any v prime and d prime as before. Okay, so maybe uh, uh, I should again draw a picture for you. So let me again draw the cone C y as I did um, on the on this page. So let me draw the cone C y here. Starting from here, starting from here, but thinner, a bit thinner. Okay, so this is my CY. Now we uh, we have these vectors. Uh, we have the vector v uh, corresponding to this chosen vector from this set. This is this vector v. So we have other vectors, some v primes and uh, v primes.
and vd bar, vd prime bars, these vectors, so some other vectors, like this. And what we get? We get a function. Uh, we get uh, a, a function given by this weight lambda, a function uh, on this vector space where, this, where the cone c sub uh, y sits. A function uh, which takes. Uh, well, let me let me draw this uh, vector, this linear function on the same page. Say uh, on the same uh, on the same picture. Say here, this is lambda. Uh, and uh, this function uh, uh, has the following property. It vanishes uh, on V, and it takes positive values on all other generators of this cone. So, uh, so the hyperplane, the hyperplane, uh, which is the kernel of this function, is some, somewhere here. It is this hyperplane. OK? Uh, and you see from this picture, uh, but of course you, you see it from this formula. This picture just illustrates this formula. You see from this picture uh, that uh, indeed the vector v belongs to the extremal to an extremal ray. Uh, so this implies uh, this implies that v indeed belongs to the extremal ray uh, of this cone uh, C gamma, C, C y, excuse me, not containing uh, the image of any color. So this extremal ray does not contain uh, any vector of the form V d bar p d prime bar where d prime ranges over all colors in this set so we have proved one direction that uh, we have proved one direction that any vector from this set uh, is an indivisible vector uh, on well, some array with this problem indivisible yeah, 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 we didn't, yeah, excuse me, yeah, excuse me. We did not speak about indivisibility, let me postpone this for a while. So uh, we, we, we proved this inclusion, inclusion of the left side in, into the right side, except for indivisibility. This will come later. Uh, now let me prove the opposite inclusion. So conversely, conversely, Uh, uh, recall that the cone C sub y is spent as a convex cone is spent by the vectors v and vd bar where v ranges over this set and vd bar ranges over uh, over this set well, not, not VD bar, uh, but uh, VD bar is a vector corresponding to a color, to a color D ranging over this set. By definition, uh, this cone uh, is spanned by this uh, set of vectors. Uh, and therefore, it immediately follows that any extremal ray uh, not containing any one of these vectors has to be spent by some of the remaining generators is spent by some v in v over y. 
So when you have a finitely generated convex cone uh, uh, generated by a finite set of vectors, then uh, each extreme array of this cone contains a generator from the generating set. This is again uh, an, an obvious statement from, from convex geometry. Uh, so uh, we have proved uh, the opposite inclusion that any of these vectors uh, is contained in here, again, except for indivisibility. So this means up to proportionality. But now, uh, why, uh, why, uh, why the vectors corresponding to this set are indivisible? Uh, uh, so indivisibility, uh, uh, indivisibility property is about the, um, the value group of this valuation. Uh, because um, uh, uh, each of these vectors can be considered as a function on the weight lattice. So here you see the values of these vectors uh, at, at weights, yeah? For instance, at the weight lambda. So each of these vectors uh, can be considered as a function, as a linear function on the weight lattice. Uh, and uh, uh, the value group of this function is a cyclic group. Uh, but uh, the vector corresponds to evaluation. Uh, so, th so the, the evaluation uh, given by this vector corresponds to a divisor if and only if the uh, cyclic group uh, is just Z itself, if the value group is, is Z. So uh, if you consider a vector, uh, uh, if you consider a vector uh, corresponding to evaluation, this means that the value group is Z. Then this implies that this vector V is indivisible. And vice versa. Uh, so uh, if you have a vector with valuation group Z, then uh, uh, evaluation, if, if you have evaluation with the valuation group Z, then this means that the respective uh, linear function on the weight lattice takes integer values and all integers uh, occur among values. So uh, uh, the value group of the linear function V on the weight lattice is uh, exactly Z. And this means that uh, this vector V is an indivisible vector in the dual of the weight lattice. So now the indivis indivisibility property is also justified, I hope. And this ends the proof of the lemma. So indivisibility states for this value group, and this is exactly the property uh, uh, of the valuation corresponding to uh, corresponding to uh, to a divisor, because our more general valuations may take values uh, in rational numbers, a cyclic subgroup of rational numbers. But if you have a valuation corresponding to a divisor, this should be should be exactly uh, exactly the value group Z, okay? So now we have proved this lemma. And let me summarize. Uh, so now it is maybe time to summarize what we have proved. Uh, if there are no questions about the proof of lemma four, I still expect that maybe there are some questions. No, not yet, okay? Then um, to summarize what we have proved, uh, uh, so uh, we introduced the comb, we introduced the comb uh, spanned by the vectors corresponding to uh, this finite set of valuations in the valuation comb and this finite set of colors. Uh, both sets correspond to all B-stable, uh, well, the union of the sets corresponds to all B-stable uh, prime divisors on my spherical, simple spherical variety containing the closed order. So uh, we, we are considering the respective vectors in the, dual, uh, in the dual lattice or in the vector space spanned by this dual lattice. And we span a convex cone by this finite set of vectors. Uh, and the lemmas uh, which we have proved uh, describe certain properties of this convex cone. First, this convex cone is pointed, and additionally, 
uh, the vectors corresponding to all colors in these distinguished subsets are non-zero. So neither of these colors maps to zero in this cone. Okay. The second property is that uh, uh, this cone intersects the evaluation cone in its relative interior. And the final lemma uh, 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 explains us how to recover the initial set of G invariant valuations corresponding to G stable prime divisors uh, on X, how to recover this set from the cone, which we introduced, and from this set of colors. Okay? So uh, these properties of the cone uh, C sub Y and the set of colors D over Y uh, established in, lemma, in lemmas 2, 3, and 4 can be axiomatized uh, in the following definition. So let me give you a definition. Uh, definition. A colored cone, a colored cone uh, in uh, the vector space E is a pair is a pair, say C, script C, and script B, where well, B is a certain subset of colors. C is a convex cone in the vector space E spent by the dual weight lattice, convex cone, generated by by the vectors corresponding to the colors from B, so by the vectors V, D, bar, uh, corresponding to the colors taken from B and finitely many vectors from the valuation cone, some VIs in the valuation cone. Third, the cone C is pointed or for any color D in this subset B, script B, the respective vector is non zero. VD bar is non zero for any D in B. And finally, the final condition is that the relative interior, let me put it on the next line to give more space, the relative interior of C intersects the valuation cone. So a pair consisting of a convex cone C, a pair, excuse me, a pair consisting of the convex cone C and a certain set of colors B satisfying these five properties is called a colored cone in the vector space E. Maybe again, let me give you a picture um, just to imagine how all these things look like. Uh, let me draw the evaluation cone first. For instance, well, let here be the origin. Let me start from the evaluation cone. So here is the evaluation cone. Thank you. 
Okay. This is the variation column. Uh, we have a set of colors. So here are the colors. Say this vector, maybe this one. and say this one, these are the colors. Or more precisely, uh, these vectors are the images of the colors uh, in this space E, because the map from colors to, to these vectors uh, may be not injective, as I explained before. So these are the colors. And now you take a cone uh, spent by some of the vectors in uh, some of the vectors in the relation cone and some of the colors. For instance, let us take a vector in here. Say this one. Maybe there are other vectors in the variation cone, but uh, for the picture, let, let me just take this one. And let me take some of the colors, say uh, this color, uh, this color uh, will be uh, in my set uh, script B. This color is in B and say uh, this color is also in B. And this color uh, marked by blue is not in B. And uh, we take the vectors corresponding the colors corresponding to the colors from the set B. So this and this. Yeah. And spend the cone by all these vectors. So let me draw this cone here. Excuse me. Not like this. So you have this edge and this edge, and here is a whole cone. Excuse me. Here is a whole cone. So he, this is this is uh, my C. Okay. Uh, this is the picture of uh, how the colored cones look like. What what are they? What are they like? Uh, and uh, uh, what we have proved in uh, the previous lemmas in lemmas uh, two, three, and four, we have proved. So let me let me write it here, maybe. So well, better to say lemmas two and three. Lemmas two and three. Say that the pair consisting of the cone C sub Y and the set of colors D over Y, the set of colors containing the closed orbit is a colored cone in the sense of this definition. This is exactly what these lemmas say. And lemma four says how to recover the set, uh, uh, the set uh, V over Y from this colored cone, from this pair, okay? Uh, and now 
uh, we can formulate uh, the classification of uh, the main theorem about classification of uh, simple spherical varieties. So the theorem, the main theorem says that there is a natural one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, simple uh, spherical varieties uh, containing a fixed spherical homogeneous space, why not as the open orbit? A one to one correspondence between this set and the set of all colored cones in the vector space E spanned by the dual weight lattice. The correspondence, of course, is given by associating with the spherical variety X with the closed orbit uh, Y, uh, its colored cone, which is the pair CY and D over Y. So the theorem says that, uh, so this correspondence is what we have constructed right before. So to each uh, to each simple spherical variety, we can associate uh, we can associate a colored cone, uh, and uh, uh, we have to prove two things: that this correspondence is injective. That means that if you are given two different spherical embeddings of one and the same spherical homogeneous space, why not? Then uh, uh, the colored cones would be distinct. And uh, we also have uh, to prove the surjectivity uh, that for any colored cone, there exists a simple spherical variety corresponding to this colored cone. Okay. Well, today we have just uh, five minutes left. Uh, so uh, we shall prove the easy part of the theorem. We shall prove injectivity. Let's start the proof uh, of the theorem by uh, proving injectivity of this correspondence. Well, Professor, I want to ask a yes. question. Yes, please. Different simple spherical varieties may have non-isomorphic closed G orbit, right? Uh, well, I mean, they may have non-isomorphic or even isomorphic closed G orbit. If you are considering G orbits just as single things, they, they may be isomorphic as homogeneous spaces. But uh, uh, when, I, when I'm speaking about different spherical varieties, uh, I mean that there is no isomorphism of one spherical variety onto another one, extending the identical map on the open orbit. We are, we are considering uh, now, we are yes, considering... Yes, yes. I, mm -hmm. I, I mean that. Uh, I, I was asking, uh, it, is it true that different simple spherical varieties may, may correspond to non-isomorphic closed G uh, orbit, right? Uh, well, both things are possible. Uh, if you have two different spherical varieties, two different simple spherical varieties with one and the same open orbit, it may happen that their closed orbits are non-isomorphic, and it may also happen that the closed orbits are isomorphic. Both things can happen. Oh, I know, I know. OK. So now let's prove the injectivity. Suppose, uh, suppose you are given another simple spherical variety. So suppose uh, X prime is another simple spherical variety corresponding, uh, well, containing the closed orbit Y prime, for instance. Uh, another simple uh, spherical variety with the same colored cone. So suppose that the colored cone of this guy, Cy prime, comma D over Y prime, is the same as Cy, comma D over Y. Uh, we want to prove that these varieties X and X prime are actually isomorphic. 
First, observe that uh, uh, this equality of colored cone implies by lemma four, by lemma four, implies uh, that the sets V over Y prime and V over Y are the same because this set is recovered from the colored cone as lemma four explains. Now, uh, since both X and X prime contain uh, one and the same open G orbit Y naught, there is a G equivalent birational map which extends the identity map on Y naught. So we have the following picture. Uh, uh, there is a birational map from X to X prime which extends the identity map on the open orbit why not? Which is contained both in X and in X prime. Okay. Uh, let me denote this birational map by phi. Now consider the coordinate algebra of the open B chart on X. We had the description of this coordinate algebra. It consists of functions which are regular on the open B orbit, Y upper node, and such that uh, the evaluations corresponding to uh, B stable prime divisors on X, Y upper node are uh, take uh, non-negative non values at this function F. So this value and this value All these values are non negative for any V in V script upper Y and any D in D script upper upper Y. Okay. But since now look here. Since the colored cones are the same, and this implies that these sets are the same, the coordinate algebra for the open B chart on X is the same as the coordinate algebra for the open B chart on um, X, uh, X prime. So it is the same as the coordinate algebra of X, Y prime naught. Because uh, when you identify uh, the fields of rational functions uh, on here and here, then uh, these conditions uh, uh, describing uh, the regularity on the open B chart are the same here and here. Because this set and this set are the same. Okay? What does it mean uh, on, on the geometric level? On the geometric level, this means that, well, here you have the open B chart X, Y naught. And here you have the open B chart X, Y prime naught. But since uh, the birational map phi identifies the coordinate algebras of these two open B charts, it restricts uh, this phi restricts to an isomorphism between these affine open subsets. So phi maps isomorphically this open B chart onto this one. Uh, this is because of because of this because of this uh, because of this uh, equality of coordinate algebras which we have proven right now. Now, since the map phi is G equivariant, uh, it is, uh, you, you can uh, interchange it with the action of G. Uh, since we have uh, uh, an isomorphism uh, between these two open subsets, we have also an isomorphism given by the same map phi between the shifts of these open subsets by one and the same element of G. So for any, G small in G big, the map phi maps this open set X, Y naught shifted by G. 
isomorphically onto this shifted open set x y prime not shifted by the same g so all these uh, maps are isomorphisms not just by rational maps but by regular isomorphisms well how uh, can we use how you find g equivariant uh, well, five G equivalent just because um, it extends uh, it extends the identity map on the open orbit. Oh well, the this, is, this extension is, is unique, right? Uh, yes, of course, because uh, because uh, the biration the rational map is determined by its restriction on any dense open subset. So this why not is a dense open subset in here and in here. That's why if we are given a map on Y naught, it extends uniquely to a rational map on X. The question is about the domain of definition for this map. So where this map is regular? And we study this question. First, we explain that this map is regular on the open B chart. Next, by G equivariance, uh, this map is regular on any shift of this open B chart. And finally, finally, since my variety X is simple, it is the G span of the open B chart. So the closed orbit in X intersects this B chart, and any other orbit in X contains the closed orbit Y in its closure, and therefore it also intersects the B chart. So the B chart X, Y naught intersects all G orbits in X. This means that X is obtained from this B chart uh, by, the, by, by action of G. X is the union. X is the union of all these shifts. And since on each shifted open subset we have this isomorphism, uh, we, we get a, an isomorphism on the whole of X. So the whole of X is mapped by phi, is mapped by the map phi, isomorphically on X prime, which is again, it, it is also simple, and it is again the shift, uh, the union of all shifts of the open B charts, B chart in X prime. So this gives you X prime. So finally, we have proved that if uh, the colored cones of two simple spherical embeddings of one and the same spherical homogeneous space, if the colored cones coincide, then uh, the uh, spherical, the simple spherical varieties corresponding to these two colored cones are isomorphic. We have proved the injectivity. As for surjectivity, it is more involved, and we'll give the proof uh, in the next lecture. Now I'm stopping. Thank you. If uh, you still have questions, then I am ready to answer. I still can't understand why the g orbit of x, y naught equals x. It is not an orbit, it is a span. So you, you take all points in here and apply all elements of G. And yes. you get all points in X. Why it is so? Okay, let me maybe draw a picture for you as I usually do when I want to explain something geometric. So you have your X, right? Yes. You have the open, uh, the, you have the closed G orbit in X, this Y. And you have the open B chart, the canonical open B chart intersecting Y, this X, Y, not. <laughs> now, if you have any other orbit, if you have any other orbit in X, then it contains the closed orbit in its closure. So this guy, this guy represents this, I mean, represents any other G orbit in X. Any other G orbit, say, I don't know, say G dot small x, any other G orbit. And uh, this G orbit contains Y, and since Y intersects X, Y naught, then this G orbit, this blue G orbit, also intersects X, Y naught, right? Yeah. 
you see it at the picture. Uh, so any orbit in X intersects X, Y not. And this is exactly what is written here. Any orbit, any any closure of the orbit intersects X, Y not, not any and orbit. Even any, and, and even any orbit intersects because, because uh, X, Y not is open. Is open, right? Yes, uh, yes, X, Y not is open. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, well, uh, no, 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 I don't think so. Uh, uh, the closure of a set, the set, uh, uh, the closure of the orbit intersect the, the open set, right? Yes. Then uh, the orbit itself intersects the open set. If the closure of something intersects uh, an open set, then this something also intersects the open set. Just, oh, just because the set is open. Oh, uh, because the, the, the open, the open neighborhood of anything in the closure uh, intersects the, the original set. Yes, 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 yes. yes. This is just a very basic topological argument. So, uh, more questions? Let me repeat again that you, if, uh, if you will have any questions after the lecture or maybe a couple of days after the lecture, do not hesitate to write me on email. I will answer, I will try to answer to any question. If anything is unclear, uh, anything uh, was explained not, uh, not well during the lecture, then you can always specify uh, all unclear things in emails. Okay, so uh, uh, on the next lecture, we shall uh, prove the subjectivity and we establish this theorem uh, in full. <laughs> and after that, we turn from simple embeddings to arbitrary spherical varieties, to arbitrary embeddings of spherical homogeneous space, of the spherical homogeneous space, and uh, will thereby uh, handle the second problem. Uh, which uh, I formulated on the previous lecture, that is uh, how to glue spherical embeddings, to, how to glue simple spherical embeddings together to obtain arbitrary spherical embeddings of a, uh, of a, a, a given spherical homogeneous space. So we shall finally resolve this problem uh, in full generality. But this will be uh, on the next lecture. Now, if uh, there are no more questions uh, concerning this lecture, then maybe I'll stop sharing. No more questions. Then I stop sharing. And I hope to see you all next Monday on my next lecture. So, goodbye.